Okay, hello. We are here with Under Stuergard, and you are a member of the, I'm going to have you say this in a minute, Frederiksberg City Council. Yeah. Can you please just say it in Danish? Frederiksberg. Exactly. City Council, uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I met Anders, I met you, um, it was just this past mm -hmm. March, because you are a European young leader, 2024, so this current cohort, and I was um, at the extremities, the European Young Leaders uh, 2024 seminar in Paris, organized by Friends of Europe, and so that's how I came to meet you, and it's um, been really nice. We've been chatting before we started recording here. I wanted to reach out to you, uh, as you know, because um, one of my missions at Pedestrian Space, where I'm uh, focused on issues of walkability and sustainable mobility broadly, is this mission about how do we depoliticize sustainable mobility? Of course, there's no perfect answer. And depending on which city we're in, it might be more of an achievable or unachievable task in today's climate. Um, every place is sort of on a different uh, part of the spectrum. But I grew up going to Sweden, you know, for my summer vacations and and getting a glimpse into a world where public transportation, riding bikes and pedestrianism seemed at least a bit more democratic and not as heavily politicized um, as other places I experienced. So as you are, first of all, active politically, um, you were formerly um, formerly the national chairperson of conservative youth when you were a little bit younger. Um, mm -hmm. And now currently, uh, I've been learning about, pardon my pronunciation, Fredericksberg, Fred that uh, the city within the city in Copenhagen. And I really wanted to talk to you as a conservative about this, uh, as a conservative living in Denmark, a Danish conservative, about this um, um, this need um, to sort of unpack how politicized system, sustainable mobility is and kind of get a window into what's your view and the situation there. Sure. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So what would you say, we've been talking a little bit before we started recording and you were saying some really interesting things, I think, and I think your political perspective on this is very valuable, in fact. So what would you say the situation is on the ground there? So in my municipality, it's a fairly small one. We're, we're 104,000 and we call ourselves often the city in the city of Copenhagen because our municipality is, a, is, is its own municipality inside of Copenhagen. And I think what we're always aiming for is, is to have everything you need within that small area of Copenhagen. In terms of mobility, I think it's about making sure that there's options for everybody, depending on what type of transportation, what life that you live. So we have very good access to metro. We have very good access uh, to pedestrian streets, which is extremely important. We have that in every street. And we're, we're, we're also now making, making making sure that there's biking lanes, even, even on those very few streets where we did not until recently had, have biking lanes. So in my municipality, the discussion uh, is not about whether we should have pedestrian streets or we should have biking lanes. It's, it's about how do we find, of course, always the right balance and how do we make sure that it, it is as, as easy for people as possible to pick a more sustainable mo mobility. Right, so in, in my perspective, this is a really great example of um, a place where mobility is not so heavily weighted, where it, it's not in some places it's sustainable mobility is like sort of framed as the liberal agenda or something. And, and you know, as we were talking earlier as well, my perspective is riding a bike should never be something reserved for, for leftists or something that's perceived as leftist. So um, I think the Danish example really excites me. So what do you think is different there than other places where sustainable mobility is still so heavily politicized? Oh, I, I think there's there's many reasons for it. I think perhaps the one of the reasons is, of course, also a historical one, that we have not been as much of a car country as, for example, the, the, the United States. It's been much more usual for people to ride a bike here. And I would say, like, even even, even our right-wing mayor, when, when, when we had one uh, a couple of years back, he would still take the bike everywhere. And I also travel with the bike everywhere. I don't have, have a car. So it's not... 
an identity issue as much. So I think that's that's a quite in, in important thing. I think another thing is that since our cities is planned around it, and many of our cities, unlike the United States, for example, has some very old uh, urban centers, I think it's 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 been much more natural for us to walk and to take the bike than it is in a more car planned city cities so i think that's 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 one of the reasons but i would not lie and say that the question is not politicized here at at all we're all, we're always still dis discussing how do we find the right balance and there'd be people in my municipality that would perhaps go further than i who would say okay we should not have any cars in our in our municipality we should close it off for cars um while I and my party would be perhaps a bit more leaning towards, let's make sure there's good options for different types of families. So it is it is not completely depoliticized, but I think it's not an identity issue as much as it is perhaps in in, in many many other countries. That's really interesting. Yeah, the identity issue is huge, and of course, the U.S. is like a, a mega example. But right here in Europe, I think we have examples of where it's really heavily politicized, and and um, cities that were clearly not uh, with areas that were clearly not designed for cars that are just flooded with you know cars now parked on sidewalks, this and that. So, um, I believe, and and additionally, throwing in the topic of the fifteen minute city, as we know, which has become so politicized as well. So definitely, the U.S. is an example where it's a major identity issue. And I I actually would be curious about your insight um, on that too. Communicating with conservatives in different countries, including in European countries, where it is more politicized than than Denmark. Would that be your um, sort of main kind of takeaway is um, exploring how unpacking the identity part of it also, in, along with, of course, how the historical dimensions and how space is prioritized for cars, maybe more so in other European countries than Denmark? I mean, it's city planning is not a conversation I've had with 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 many other European con conservatives. So I would not be an expert <laughs> on how on how they they feel in that regard. I think the Nordic countries are perhaps a bit more similar in that regard. I would still consider our sister parties in Sweden and Norway to be like us in a to a certain degree, still being very open for green mobility and and for fifteen minute cities. I don't think again it's that's. It, it is that politicized. But mm -hmm. the more underlying reasons why there is a difference, it's difficult to tell. I mean, how do you create a culture? Because really, that's really the question. When you do have a culture for taking a bike, it's not that out of the ordinary. There's no one who would look at me as an odd guy because I take the bike every day back and forth from, uh, from, from work. And I mean, even here in my municipality and in Copenhagen, it's very usual that people, instead of buying a car, they they would they would they would have a a bike with with a large like, uh, how do you say truck or something in front of the bike. We call it a Christiania bike here, is where you can have your children on and then you take them to school with that. I think if I would be doing that in a European southern in a southern European city, I think people would look at me. It, as someone who's out of the ordinary. So it's difficult for me to explain why there is that cultural gap, but it certainly is there while, of course, there is, of course, disagreements about uh, like the role of caste. We also have that here, but it's not as heavily politicized, definitely. Oh, I'm trying to keep these recordings I do with people on these topics brief, like bite sized so people yeah. can listen while on a bike ride or, or on a metro ride. But this is so mm -hmm. interesting. I could talk at length. You don't have children, do you? No, I don't have children yet. Yet. Oh, yet. OK, so I guess when you do, we'll see you with uh, one of the Christiana bikes. <laughs> You'll have to. <laughs> so, certain, I think I think that is that that is definitely the most likely thing. I think right now I, I definitely wouldn't wouldn't want a car. And but I think it's perhaps easier for me to say uh, when I don't have children, uh, mm -hmm. because when I do speak with some in my municipality, there will still be some who says, OK, we need it. But I think it very much depends on where your work is. And there the whole 15 minutes cities also come into play, because, of course, if your work is nearby, then you're not as dependent on the car. Um, there will there will there will be some and there is some in my municipality that would have to travel far for their work. And of course, there they are a lot more dependent on on the car than I am because I just I just I just take my bike and 25 minutes later I'll I'll be 
uh, at my at my work in the other side of Copenhagen. Right. That's that's a really great point, the lifestyle issue. And and households can be mixed. You know, here I am. Uh, I'm in, I would call myself a mega walkability advocate. My husband does drive. Um, so there's occasional I'm occasionally a passenger, you know, um, mm. and my kids live predominantly by foot and public transit. But again, occasionally are in the car. Um, so it's like you said about that balance. I really, really appreciate that you brought up culture. Just on a side note my dissertation is in large part about cultures of mobility. So that's something that's endlessly fascinating about me. And I think you hit the nail on the head. That's what this is really down to. It's about how do you create a culture of mobility? Um, and I'm also glad that the 15 minute city came up organically here before we talked today, we hadn't had a conversation about that. Um, and so, no, but, 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 but I did not, I did, I did not know about the, phrase until we had the meeting with European young leaders. For me, it was just something that, yeah, of course, I suppose most largest cities in Denmark is based around that. So for me, it wasn't really a thorn thing. It was just something that I don't, I just get, I guess I did not have the phrase for. Hmm. Yeah, it is um, recently um, coined a uh, phrase by Carlos Moreno. Uh, I'm not sure what year he put it out 2018 and then since a lot of i could be wrong on the year it went out i heard about it in 2020 uh so it's recently coined a lot of research now and 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 it's really created um i would say a very practical wave of action among municipalities in countries which i think unlike denmark it's not so common. I do. I actually heard about it while I was living in Sweden, where I I was living in Orebro, and it's probably a little bit larger than your than your municipality. I said that's what I'm living in. So I actually think Nordic cities do this quite well. I actually think Nordic cities do spatial equity in planning pretty well. And to me, the really the test is too when you go to the periphery of the city, not just having the 15 minute city lifestyle for people in the heart of the city, but what about the peripheral urban quarters and the, the suburbs around? Mm -hmm. And I do think, um, I think Nordic cities are a really good, offer a lot of good case studies. So including yours apparently, which at 104,000 population, I mean, it's it's probably like a textbook example of a 15 minute city, right? Yeah. I would imagine, yeah. Yeah, so um, that's really interesting. So, uh, oh, and on one ending note, I can talk about these things for a very long time, but on one ending note, I'm curious also to learn more. Uh, you're with the, a member of the of the conservative, the Danish conservative yes, party. I am, yeah. And so green conservative conservatism, can can you share a little bit about that? <laughs> Sure, but but now but now I will probably need fifteen minutes at least uh, oh, okay. in order in order to approach we this can, subject. We can keep it but I mean, up. but I mean, I think I think of course there's different different ways of viewing at these questions. But I mean, but at least for me as a conservative, one of the things that makes me conservative is is that I believe that what I have, my country, where I come from, is a gift that I have from my ancestors. And I have a responsibility to take care of it and give it uh, in in as good an order to my children as possible. So when that is the core of the ideology and who I am, I think it comes quite naturally to take care of the environment and to take care of the planet that we live on, because it's it's not mine. It's something that I have borrowed from our ancestors and that I have a responsibility to give to my children. So I think I think that's the core of where I come from at in in this regard at this this ideological question and of course then there is a difference between where you are politically about how you approach this question i think at least here in here in denmark it also becomes a question of what methods do you bring in and how do you think that we approach this i'm very a big supporter of private initiative innovation i don't believe that it can come from itself i think what we need to do is to make pol a political sort of what can you say incentives for companies to 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 thrive so for example what i want to have is as high as co2 tax as possible but then we distribute it as tax cuts so what you do is you make sure that co2 which is an an error of the market in my opinion that you take that into account in every product what that means is that for example if you have two farmers and one can produce it his produce 
at a at at a at a cheaper rate than the other ones because he do, does not have as much, as high a tax on because he's greener then then he have maximum i incentives to become as green as possible and to find new solutions so that's the way that i come at, at it at it that the, it's an error of the market that we that 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 we need to legislate against but what we need is companies to find the solutions of tomorrow and i think we have good examples of that i mean for an example one of the biggest companies here in denmark is vestas a wind 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 turbine producers they are a very big company here in here in denmark and in fact if you look at renewable energy that i work with what are the cheapest source of energy right now it's solar and it's wind energy and that's one of the reasons why we're decarbonizing as quickly as we are because we're transitioning and because there's company who can make a buck of making the solutions of the future and i think in the united states for an example i think there's also some companies that have it well for it for an example the tesla uh, and uh, and and uh, electric ve vehicles i think that's an important thing for the for, for the future and if one wants to speed that up they should make it much more expensive to buy a fossil car and much cheaper to buy an electric car thereby you will notch the direction towards a greener future i think that's that's the shortest way of me to explain where i come from both from a value perspective of how i view the world and also the methods that i want to to use in order to achieve it well, I really appreciated hearing that the val your value perspective that you started off with and viewing your nation as a gift. I think that's really beautiful, you know, and viewing it as not as uh, not ours. I'm not Danish, but you not as yours, but something you also have to uh, take care of and um, bequeath onto, you know, uh, the next generations and also as inherited from the ancestors. That's actually really beautiful. So and, thank you. And, it, and, and that is definitely not something that I have invented. That was, mm -hmm. that is, that is Edmund Burke and his, and his idea of a generational treaty. Of course, right. that's something that was in a different time, but I think there's a lot of conservative ideologies you can look into if you if you want to create a greener future this this isn't in my opinion a left wing or right wing issue no it shouldn't be and of uh, in other groups and other cultures have of course very um, like literally the same ideology in fact it's just interesting to see it uh how it thrives in different um in different parties and different ideologies and so forth so i really appreciated hearing that so thank you uh, I'm really curious about your municipality within the municipality now, uh, and appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Sure, and if you and if you come to Copenhagen, you're also very welcome to visit my municipality. I would love to host you. Yeah, oh, I would love to take a bike ride with you. So I'll I'll look you up when I come there. Thank you. <laughs>